everybody. I want to welcome you to the Auburn Avenue Research Library tonight. Um, we're so you got it. Cool. We're we're so happy that that you're here. We're really excited to talk about uh, Modibo's new book, uh, Intimate Direct Democracy. Fort Mose, the Great Dismal Swamp, and the Human Quest for Freedom. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to take a moment to thank uh, the Auburn Avenue Research Library, Morris Gardner, um, our friend Ruben, who really hooked us up and helped everything, helped us set up everything tonight. Um, and uh, you know, th this institution is so important to Atlanta and um, has, has hosts a variety of really fantastic programming throughout the year that we really encourage y'all to uh, you know keep an eye on that programming and and come as often as you can because the more you know you don't have to, obviously everything that here is free but the more butts and seats that they have the more money they can get from the city to keep doing this thing so like keep coming um, because it's an important place uh, and um, I guess with that I'll introduce uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Modibo Kadali. Um, Modibo is a social ecologist, academic, lifelong radical activist of the civil rights, black power, and pan-Africanist movements. In the 70s, Modibo was a member of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and the African Liberation Support Committee. In 2017, uh, Modibo founded the Autonomous Research Institute for Direct Democracy and Social Ecology in Midway, Georgia. Um, we've been working together, uh, he co-founded On Our Own Authority Publishing uh, with me back in 2012, so this is our 10-year 10, 10 anniversary of doing this work. Um, and um, yeah, Modibo, it's great to be doing this with you again, and um, I understand you wanted to make some introductory remarks as well. Oh, by the way, uh, the way this will work, I should probably tell people, we'll probably talk for a minute maybe talk between ourselves for a minute, and then we're gonna open it up and have some good discussion with y'all. Uh, and so please, while Modibo's talking, please generate some questions and stuff that we can engage with. But Mo Modibo Kadali, everybody. All right, thank y'all for coming. Uh, this is indeed uh, an intimate occasion. Yeah. <laughs> we want to. We want to welcome everybody here. And uh, as time goes on, you'll see that this is an important gathering. You might not think as much now, but as time goes on, can y'all hear me? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's going to become more and more of an important gathering. And uh, just by way of uh, understanding what this book represents, uh, we, I've got one right here. This book is internationally acclaimed. I'm going to tell you that. I mean, we've been all over, all over everywhere with this little book right here, and we've got some quite a quite a few uh, endorsements. Uh, it's been the book of the month for the uh, No Name Book Club. It's been uh, regarded as a staff choice of many independent bookstores, and we can't keep enough of them in stock. That's true. <laughs> I mean, this is this selling like hotcakes. Now let me explain why we, let, let me explain a little bit about the evolution of my thinking. This is a big old book here. I wrote this book back in 1975, 76, and my students compiled it into that. Hardly nobody reads that book, and I sometimes read it and wonder what the hell was I thinking. <laughs> but but it's, it's a, it's a, it's the study in movement organizations at that time from the perspective of somebody who was active in those movements. And we can see a very clear pattern of uh, direct democracy and democracy within these movement organizations. These movement organizations, as you well know, uh, have been chronicled in libraries like this and in other places by various leaders who were attached to them. Like when you think of the Black Panther Party, you think of Huey P. Newton and Melrose Cleaver and, you know, and so people, when they want to know about what they were saying or what, the, what that Black Panther Party was, they go talk to them. Uh, and, you know, all the organizations had one critical flaw. They were undemocratic, and as a result of being undemocratic, they were male chauvinists, Women were not given the, any kind of uh, 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 
avenue for expressing themselves. And that's clear from this book. It really is, uh, especially with the league where I was active. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I've come to be proud of this book. At first, I was just appeasing my students. My students just wanted to do it. I said, well, why do you want to do something like that? And they said, well, you know, somebody, the people need to know. <laughs> so, I mean, I've come to be a pr proud of this book. Then some long years later, uh, we issued this book here called Pan-African Social Ecology. Now, the problem that we were addressing there was we had the environment, the so-called environmental movement was jumping off, and large numbers of black people or Pan-Africanists were not seeing themselves in it, and they didn't understand their role in it. And we saw two monumental thinkers from that time, C.L.R. James, who was a neo-Pan-Africanist. This was a, you know, a stateless kind of Pan-Africanist. And then we saw uh, Maury Butchkin, a white activist radical. And they were active during the same time, but they were separated from one another, and they didn't know what one another seemed. They never cited one another. They never, they, they, do you think they actually knew one another at all? My theory is uh, that Bookchin had to be aware of CLR, uh, right? They were both Trotskyists around the same time. Yeah. And, um, or at least they had both been Trotskyists, Trotskyists in were, their past. Were, yeah. And, um, and they both were writing about ancient Athens and direct democracy and stuff like that. My thinking is that at some point along the way, I have no evidence to back this up. I think that Bookchin read C.L.R. James, uh, Every Cook Can Govern, to somewhere, yeah, and it made yeah. some kind of impression on him. Uh, but I don't think that he ever cited him. Yeah, they never cited one another in their footnotes. Uh, Bookchin was a, a, a Jewish radical from, uh, well, from Brooklyn, New York, and C.L.R. was, uh, uh, African Caribbean radical from Trinidad, spending a lot of time in, in, um, in England. So what I did in this book here is brought them together. So people are, nowadays wouldn't be doing that kind of stuff because uh, people are separated too much, far too much. And, and, and when you look at the intellectual creativity and intellectual writing of the time, we were victimized by this separation. This Jim Crow stuff has really had a real hard uh, impression on scholarship. And then we wrote this book, Intimate Direct Democracy, which is why we're here today. Now what I was trying to do there is to show that America was never democracy at all. People were talking about we need to live up to the true meaning of the American creed and how this and that, but America never was democratic. In fact, America destroyed the direct democratic tendency in the country, which was represented in the native people. And that's what this book showed. But before we get into that, I want to ask y'all some questions, okay? I'm going to ask y'all, you know, things that uh, uh, I will try to understand where you are, so I won't say anything that is offensive to anybody. <coughs> okay, this first question. And by the way, just raise your hand. If you believe it or you don't believe it, or just don't ask me, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? Just go on your breast impression of what, you, what I meant, okay? Do you believe that history repeats itself? Okay. You believe history repeats itself? <laughs> I think he believes it too. Uh, do you believe that everything goes around, comes around? Everything goes around, comes around. Do you believe that the government of the United States is a democracy? Uh, okay, all right, well, we're on the same page. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, let's, let's go. Was it ever a democracy? Oh, all right. <laughs> well, we need to just discuss this then. <laughs> Do you believe that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves? <laughs> People just laughing at this. These were real questions some years ago. I guess they're no longer questions anymore. I think they're ready. <laughs> I think they're ready. Or well, let's ask this one. Do you believe that every successful social movement must have a group of very strong leaders? Gee, I 
All right, we're, we're definitely among friends. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're definitely among friends. Okay, let's ask another question. If you were a slave, would you, I just want to ask you this for honest, you know, honest response. If you were a slave, would you escape to a swamp full of alligators and mosquitoes or remain a slave? No, 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 I'm asking the question right now. Is the hand or? No, if you were a slave, would, yeah, yeah, would you escape? Would you escape? Okay. <laughs> For alligators and mosquitoes and swamp, you don't know nothing about you. Okay, all right. Okay, y'all, uh, let me see here. I want some of these questions are not even worth asking anymore. I want to ask you some questions. Yeah, ask me some, ask me some. Let me, just, let me see if I've exhausted the ones I wanted to ask. Oh, there's, there's one. Do you believe that Native American people should be given a well-maintained and adequate housing allowance, a free education at all levels, free health care, and a monthly stipend uh, in, re in reparation for the lands and the uh, suffering that the American government has caused them. Okay, just one more question. Man. Do you believe that African American people deserve some form of reparation? Okay, well, all right, Andrew, you can go ahead and answer. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Modibo. Yeah. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for participating in that uh, uh, warm-up, because that does actually help. Because sometimes, <laughs> yeah. you know, I think every time you do that, uh, it is a little bit different response from the crowd on certain questions, especially on the questions of, like, leadership and, and democracy and stuff like that. Um, which actually, I guess that brings me to the first thing I wanted to ask you. Well, actually, can I ask, I'm going to ask the audience one more question. Sure, um, man. Which is... you get to ask a question, you can ask us the same damn question. Yeah. Um, can I just see a show of hands of, of who has already read uh, Intimate Direct Democracy? Okay, cool. So, uh, <laughs> so about a third of the group. Okay, that's, that's cool. Not bad. That's not it's bad. not bad. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, but everybody else should like you know totally buy it when you leave if you haven't if you don't already have a cup. All of Modibo Kadali's books are on sale in the lobby. Um, the uh, okay. Um, so for the folks who haven't read it, Modibo, um, I'm wondering if we could talk just a little bit about the title first. Mm -hmm. um, and you already talked about what the the book is about these uh, uh, indigenous African and and various maroon histories in. Uh, North America, specifically looking at two sites, the Great Dismal Swamp and Fort Mose. Uh, the title... Oh, yeah. What? what? Okay. This is, a, this is a first... This this map, by the way, was made by my partner, Margot Fortune. Who's Where, where's Margot? Margot might be out by the table yeah. and will probably come in here and snap some pictures. Yeah, well, she, she did this. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, so I was wondering if you could talk about what is direct democracy? How does direct democracy differ from what it is that a lot of people assume, apparently nobody in here, <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but a lot of people assume democracy to be uh, in the, uh, the United States context? Yeah. Well, you can't have any kind of... Uh, democracy if you don't know the people that you're dealing with, really. I mean, and most of the people don't know these people. They call themselves senators, and they put up anybody they want to, and they, you vote for them. But when you vote for them, you really release all of your, their obligations to you, and they, they don't give a damn about you, really. But um, you, you can vote if you like. I mean, I mean it's, no, it's not a, a, a total, total waste, but in America, uh, there's no democracy, as we all agree here. But in order to understand what democracy can be, you have to know the people you're dealing with. You got to know who their mama is. You got to know who their papa is. You got to know what they did. You got to know what their record is. You got to know. You got to know them. And that is why the native people always had older women uh, in consultation when they decided to, to figure out who would be, in, in the case of the book, we call them the Miko. And these are the, um, 
the uh, Creek, they call them the Creek Indians, but they really were the Muscogee. And uh, these people had a, a governmental strategy which they had direct democracy. Everybody participated in the decision making, deciding how they're going to live. And so the intimate part, direct democracy means you don't vote for other people, you decide that stuff yourself. And so what I am, I'm, I'm an advocate of uh, 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 dismantling all these big governments and, and, and taking the local control, the local everyday people, de developing this kind of stuff for their life. Now this is going to be a generational struggle. But there's a, and my next book is, 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 uh, is about that. There's, there's people who, there are people who uh, think that the bigger central governments are the more democratic. And can you imagine, just to give you a little mathematical exercise, there are 350 million people in, a, in the United States of North America. And at the national level, there are about three, uh, 439 people who make laws. Can you imagine just the mathematical part of it? 300 and, uh, 439 people making laws for 350 million people. Now, there's a way in which you can organize a society where local people in their local situation can control how they live. And that way, you can have a more uh, ecological society. You can have a more just society. But, uh, but you're going to have to do away, with, do away with private property. Nobody should own uh, the, as their private property what every, the way everybody else makes a living. Nobody should own the forest. Nobody should own the factories. Those should be collectively owned by everybody. And, and that's, the, that's the socialist element in it. But direct democracy is basically, and it has to be distinguished from a representative democracy or indirect democracy. Direct democracy is a type of government where people at the local level, through their discussions face to face with people they know, decide how they're going to live. That's, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. That was great. Um, so I'm thinking maybe we can go all of the maps that you, or most of the maps that we're going to show you here and some of the images are uh, in Modibo's latest book, Intimate Direct Democracy. Let, and let me say something about this. Map. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. That's where I was going. Go, go, go ahead. You go ahead. Oh, I was going to say maybe we just want to click through and we can talk a little bit about each. Okay, each map well, and the conclusions because I think the maps tell a story yeah, they do. that is, is reflected in the book and uh, maybe we can just kind of share that with yeah, people. Let me just say something about the book first though. The book is a small book and we made it small so that everybody could read it and we made it made the, made the um, lettering large so that people who, who are you know who, who visually challenged could read it. My, my mother, my mother. It's pretty standard size. <laughs> well, okay, well, this is the space where. Well, well you can, if you can see it, that's good. Yeah. yeah. And my mother said when, when she first saw this book a long time ago, yeah, she said, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she said, well, as long as you make sure that somebody can read it. <laughs> but anyway, the first part of the book consists of a, a preface and a, uh, and a prospectus. Uh, and an inter, and a, and a an introduction by Andrew, where Andrew talks about the local, he's my editor, right? And he tells you, it tells you about all these places in the local registry. You can go to the Dismal Swamp now. You can go to the Everglades now. But the Dismal Swamp probably is probably like that. Show the Dismal Swamp up there. Dismal Swamp is up here. Yeah. In the Everglades, you, you're gonna have to go down below Lake Okeechobee, way down there. Yeah, down so. Down there. But in, 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 in the time of, 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 of uh, the Great Dismal Swamp in Fort Mose, it, uh, it, it, it expanded all the way up past Lake Okeechobee. Right. So nowadays, the Everglades are kind of down here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then this kind of shows their historical uh, reach, which you could, I mean, you can look at old maps and see that. In fact, there's a really interesting representation on one of the next maps. But so this map, the reason why uh, we asked Margot to make, make this map for us was just to show where some of the places that we talk about in the book, just as sub you can kind of see spatially where everything is kind of related to each other. Um, so obviously there's the Great Dismal Swamp here, 
which was a site of marinage, you know, which is people who were fleeing slavery um, and were self-emancipating, were fleeing into this very, very large swampy area and uh, forming communities there. And then you had uh, the same thing going on. Actually, the original, that's something we should probably specify, is that the, the Underground Railroad originally ran south, right? Yeah. Not north, south to Spanish territory. Yeah. So people fleeing from uh, South Carolina towards Florida, towards St. Augustine, and set creating this town here called Fort Mose, actually Fort Musa, which we can talk about later. Um, and, uh, and in this area in between, which is kind of where we are now, and especially the coastal region, which is now Georgia, this was kind of a disputed borderland where there was all sorts of con, uh, conflicts and contestations. Uh, so should we go to the next map? Yeah, just also want to sh emphasize that this history includes the ecology of the region. I think that's a contribution that we're making here. That um, up and down, up and down those coastal areas, you see all those rivers there? Up and down those coastal areas there, there's swamps and marshes and bogs and barrier islands. And, and it was a naturally operating system then. Now, now it's all uh, polluted and uh, what they call capitalist development. But at that particular point, they, 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 could, grow, they could grow rice down on, show, show the rice thing, down between Charleston and Savannah and all the way down that way. And up north they could grow tobacco, but tobacco couldn't come across there. <coughs> but anyway, it's in the book. <laughs> That's in the book. Okay, so. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we go. The, uh, so, Modibo, can you tell this, us what we're looking at here? This, this right here is a, a map of the Guinea coast of West Africa. And if you read uh, the so-called progressive writers, they want to say that, yes, there were Africans, kings, and queens, and there were great African civilizations. They were. They were Ghana, Mali, and Sungai. But these places were oppressive. As far as ordinary people were concerned, these places were brutal places of e exploitation, and the people were running away. The people started migrating away from these places, going down through uh, to, to the west coast, to the coastal area. And they came in waves, waves and waves. And uh, the anthropologists kind of can show this. So we, we critique not only the straight up racist notions that are a part of this historiography, but also the, uh, uh, the what, what we call the black, black, black people, <laughs> we, the, uh, <laughs> the Afrocentric people who don't do anything but blackenize everything and all of the oppressive categories and uh, uh, analysis remain in place. And so we try to show that this was the place where people were, were moving away from uh, the central um, big, big, big uh, states that they were actually feudal, Ghana, Mali, and Sangha, ancient Ghana, Mali, and Sangha. So while they're moving, right, culture but is coming with them. Culture is coming with them and they bring in rice to the coast. R culture, technology, yeah, technology. Ag agricultural technology, the, the, the um, the, techno the, the technology, the science, in rice cultivation. Um, and, they, and, and they had all kinds of complicated ways of raising rice, but the rice was not for a big cash crop to be sold. The rice was for distribution among the population. But they were skilled at it. And that's what the, uh, the traders, the slave traders were looking for. They were looking for people who could make money for them. So they first, uh, took the, I guess, what, what would you call it, Andrew, the tobacco trade? Because tobacco is the indigenous uh, native population. That's like marijuana today, I guess. I don't know. What would you say about that, the tobacco up there in Virginia? Well, I mean, I guess you could, you could call it, 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 it's this kind of agricultural, like yeah, you said, was. cash crop appropriation of, of this indigenous crop, right? Yeah, it was. It that, was. Um, and that they're saying, okay, we can turn this around and sell this at a market, right, yeah. back in Europe. And... Um, but like you said, so coming south, so if we look at the previous map, which by the way, I just saw Margo. There's Margo right there. Margo, Margo made this map. We mentioned you earlier and you got some applause and then you weren't here, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so tobacco is happening largely kind of up here, but also inland in some places, you know. Yeah. But it cannot, 
in these coastal uh, colonial towns and in, in these areas like that, you can't, you don't have the space, the dry, enough dry land to grow uh, tobacco so much. But what you can grow is rice. Especially down here on the coast. Right. This here, this is the rice coast. And by the way, I'm from Riceboro, Georgia. Yeah. That's where, Riceboro. So, I mean, I'm uniquely qualified to talk about this. Yeah. But, but, but actually, when I was coming up, there were people actually growing rice there, individual people growing rice, and they don't grow rice there anymore. And, and, and people in your generation went and said, why is this called Riceboro? Because they used to grow a hell of a lot of rice there. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, I mean, so some, some people, like, in the, in the kind of, like, cookie-cutter version of, of history and, and Georgia history that you might have gotten in school if you went here, you'd, you'd think that everything, that like all the, uh, the so-called plantation uh, agriculture was cotton in Georgia, right? Yeah. But, but actually, originally, it, and, and especially on the coast, uh, it was rice, 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 rice. And um, it was very, very, very big cash crop. A lot of people were enslaved specifically to grow rice, and they were targeted for enslavement because of their scientific and technological abilities, and, and, and uh, which was, um, you know, passed yeah. down throughout this culture. Then you see the rice right down the rivers, and they came in waves to the coast. So, th so yeah, here in Senegambia, yeah. mm -hmm. this is where a lot of people were targeted for enslavement. They were kidnapped and trafficked and, uh, and shipped here, right? Yeah. Now, what's interesting, Modibo well, is... Up, 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 well, Charleston at first. Though. Yeah, Charleston first, Charleston right. Charleston should be called that's Rice, important. Rice City. <laughs> yeah, that's important. Yeah. Um, because Georgia, like I said, at first was this contested border area. And there was also this weird thing for a brief time where, I don't know if, if you all knew this, but there was this thing... Anybody here heard of the Georgia experiment? Okay, great. Um, so the Georgia experiment was actually when Georgia... Actually, we, this is the first time... I get to talk about this mm. in one of these talks, Go but um, so we mentioned before that there was an African settlement here at Fort Mose. A par big part of the story of this book is that that settlement, there was there was a militia that that uh, was at the heart of that settlement, and they participated in raids sponsored by the Spanish, but on largely on their own authority into. Uh, South Carolina colony and they were given the English who were their former enslavers they were given the English a, a hell of a time so this guy named Oglethorpe comes up with this idea he says let's make a new colony south of the Carolinas and um, that colony is there's gonna be no slavery in that colony and some people later on they try to turn that around and make it seem like Oglethorpe was this enlightened individual right but there, it was a tactical thing. Um, it was to have a kind of like a white majority buffer zone between uh, Flo Spanish Florida and the British Carolina colony. Um, and then also to, to make more settlements along this coast from which he could launch uh, attacks onto, uh, into Spanish Florida, mm -hmm. which he eventually did in 1740. Um, so this is part of this, of Georgia being this contested region. Now, now the, the people that they had who came over to like establish this colony were largely religious dissidents. And they said, oh, they said we're gonna give you all some land in, in Georgia, but you can't, the, the condition is you, you may not use, uh, you may not import enslaved Africans. You can, you can only use convict labor from Great Britain. So they were shipping over this convict labor but these, these new landowners um, in the new Georgia colony, they were very jealous of the money being made up here in Charleston. Because you, correct me if I get any of this wrong. Right? Yeah. And, they, and they, were like, they were really complaining uh, because they were like, we want to make, we want rice money. We don't want, is it, Oglethorpe was like, well, maybe you can make, make some silk. Maybe you can, uh, you know, make some candles and, and stuff like because they had a lot of beekeeping and stuff like that, and they were and, and they were like, no, we want rice money, so they started importing people illegally, and they start protesting, and eventually the the board of trustees of Georgia says, okay, well you can have slavery now. But also want to make a, a very important point: the racial divide was no black white thing then. The Spanish militia was black and mulatto because the uh, 
Moors was in Spain and, and North Africa, uh, and they were darker people. They would look kind of like, uh, kind of look like Puerto Ricans now or something like that, you know. <laughs> you look at look at you Puerto Rican, look like you, but, and uh, you know, they, they really they would look like us. And then the Yamasee, which were a native population, which uh, you, you can read the details about it, but a native population around Charleston, and there was, there was some Yamasee wars, and at one point, all of these people got together and was gonna drive these white settlers out of South Carolina. They almost did it, too. They almost did it. And that was known as the Yamasee War. So we wanna un want you to understand that all of these people look just like us. There was no Jim Crow, no separate bathrooms, <laughs> none of that stuff. There was just people struggling uh, to better their lives. And the, the Yamasee was a multicultural, multiracial group of people that they called Indians. See, let me explain. Just like, just like when the Jim Crow laws were passed in the United States, they just, anybody who wasn't white was black, you see? Are colored. They couldn't make up all those different signs, so they made up a couple of signs. You, if you wasn't white, you you, you go over here, and that, 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 that too, many is too many signs. <laughs> they tried to do it in South Africa. They had three different, four different signs. <laughs> but the point is, these racial separations are motivated by capitalists who are separating the laborers so that the laborers wouldn't get together. And uh, these, these people who, <clears throat> who were original settlers, and we, 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 we had to redefine some words. We don't even use plantations. We, we call them slave farms, because that's what they were. And uh, th as time went on, uh, <clears throat> these people began to be the people that we know now today. Go, 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 go to another slide. Well, um, so what we, what we talked about a little bit with this was that as people are fleeing these hierarchical societies, yeah. right, they're, um, they're becoming, in your argument in the book, increasingly democratic, yeah. Uh, yeah. less yeah. hierarchical organization. Yeah, they were more escaping hierarchy and, and these centralized states and stuff that everybody thinks that people want to go to, but they didn't want that. And people establishing that. these more horizontalist kind of yeah, flat, communities, yeah. Yeah, like you said, yeah, flat, or politically flat, yeah. right, politically is I think the term, go term go used. Um, so we talked about rice. rice yeah. Okay, so oh, there we go. So now, at the same time, <laughs> Dr. Kadali, what is happening in North America? Well, there's this place right here. It looks pretty, right? This is Cahokia. If you ever been to St. Louis, how many of you people heard of Cahokia? Great, 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 great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Cahokia is a hierarchical, brutal, centralized state that people who are, uh, are non-critical historiographers, they will venerate a place like this. To me, this looks, this looks terrible. <laughs> this, I mean, I can see, the, see, the, see the, the people being beaten and going around, and I see the, the king and the, the, the shamans and all these people that they're living. There are people who think they're better than other people who live in this place. And, and so people started just like they were migrating in, in, in West Africa, they started leaving this place. And they were, these are the people that became this, this Muskogee and the people who were up and down the rivers and streams that white people came in contact with when they came, when they met over here. Go, go ahead so go. this is, just to clarify, this is around, what is it, 1260 yeah. AD? Um, this Cahokia site, which you can still visit today. Yeah, you can. It's um, on the National Register. If you're around St. Louis, go by there and check it out. Um, this was, it, a lot of historians, especially if you, if you read his, histories that were written, you know, 20, 30 plus years ago, um, they'll talk about this mystery of what, oh, yeah. why Cahokia was mysteriously abandoned, right? And one thing that, that Modibo put forward, and then, and then around the same time, the late David Graeber also yeah. put, put forward, uh, this idea that that there was a very conscious fleeing of this place because um, and what Graeber has said elsewhere which I really liked was he was like indigenous peoples in the in North America had tried these large centralized societies uh, you know way before Europeans showed up and they didn't work and they didn't like them and they and they left and they and they moved on and they and uh, they established other communities that were 
uh, more flat and more decentralized, a much more human kind of scope. Um, and so that process is happening. Um, there we go. There, I know you wanted to see this one. No, no, this is what I want to see. <laughs> so see what, all, all the rivers in the southeast, see all those places right there? That's the diffuse. These people left to Well, let, let me explain what this map yeah, means. Yeah, yeah, okay, so yeah, it's a good map there, just like right. people are bringing their culture with them while they're <laughs> fleeing towards the west coast in Africa, right? At the same time, coincidentally enough, uh, people are fleeing east in North America, mm, right? Some of them went a little north, too. Sure, sure, sure. Well, well it's quite a diffusion, actually, mm, like yeah, you said. Yeah. Um, and they br are bringing with them, of course, uh, a lot of their culture and um, most notably, which you can still see, uh, their architecture, which is this mound structure, right? Mm, you see all that now, anybody here been to Akmogi Mounds down in Macon? Oh, Tori's been. <laughs> and um, so every single, this dot, this map is from 1900. And it was given to me by somebody down in the, by a ranger down in the Akmogi Park in Macon, which you should totally visit, even though in their, their museum and their signage gets a lot of stuff. It's very weird. Well, it's si right signage. off the highway. You but you should totally nice see it. It's a place to go to. Yeah. But every single dot. And they Don't believe it, though, but go there and see what lie they tell us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can talk more about the historiography. <laughs> but the, um, every single dot that you see here is a mound site. Not a mound, look, a mound site. That. So every single dot is a town. Look at that. So you can, so you can imagine this is a vibrant, vibrant, vibrant uh, uh, diffusion of... of uh, kind of small-scale urban localities, yeah. right? All over the east part of this continent. Um, so what did you want to say? About well, I, I wanted to just say that they're up and down the waterways, and they call them, the white people call them Creek Indians. But these are, these are the Mus Muscogee Indians. These are the Mus Muscogee people and some other people, too. And, and, uh, they're different groups, but they're dynamic. They're moving all over, living a life of their own. And there are not no hierarchical societies there. None. Nowhere. No kings, no queens, no noble people, no great, uh, uh, it's just, just, just people living their lives like, and these are the people that the native, uh, that um, uh, the Europeans came in contact with. And this is when that big explosion took place. You know, when they, we started moving uh, up and down the coast, and uh, the dynamic societies, and they had to interact with the uh, European society. So go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you this, and you can correct me if I if I say it wrong or clumsily, but we have we have this diffu this diffusion and the spread of these more directly democratic societies moving towards the East Coast here. I keep pointing at Georgia because. Yeah, yeah. Of my own that's, biases. That's, that's the area under consideration. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you have people being kidnapped and trafficked from here by the European colonialists. And they're being brought here. So there's, so Modibo, would you say that there, what, what culturally is happening there where the people who are kidnapped, trafficked, and enslaved brought to North America and they're encountering, I mean, they're under quite brutal circumstances, but at some point they're encountering people who have perhaps, and I'm asking you this, if yeah, you think yeah, this is true, yeah, yeah, yeah. perhaps uh, um, a, a, a culture and, and, a, and, a, and a political structure that's similar to something that they might have, have been yes, used to. Yes, yes, they would. In their and own not tradition. only that, the ecology is similar. Yes. And the ecology is similar. And if you took a map of Western Africa and put it in, inside the, the, the United States, the, the Eastern United States there, it's almost, almost like a, a puzzle will fit. And uh, these people knew swamps. They, that's why they were brought here. They knew rice. But they wanted to make the European uh, big farmers wanted rice to be produced as a cash crop for sale. That's different from the way, the purpose of rice production in, in West Africa. But rice, I mean, you have to know a lot about rice. You, you gotta know how the water moves, and the, the land was very similar, which I describe in the book. I mean, it was, it's a fresh water source coming from up country on a, on a flat plain, 
you know, a flat plain and it was, you know, it's affected by tides and you could develop a, quite a, a bit of rice there and that's what was happening. And, and those joint stock companies, see the Spanish didn't have a joint stock company, the Portuguese didn't have it, the Dutch did have it for sugar, but the joint stock companies from Europe began to capitalize and make big profits from this rice. And uh, it didn't last forever now. It lasted for as long, as long as it could, just like any kind of product, capitalist production product, even this, this, this thing right here. It, it, it won't let you, you'll sell them for a while. After a while, something else will come along, you have to buy that, you know. But so rice pro production and uh, even tobacco reached its limits uh, later, uh, tobacco later, but rice uh, reduced, produced its limits uh, in, the, in, in the consumption process and the saturation of the world market quite early. And uh, that had a, another kind of effect on the uh, social ecological situation in coastal Georgia and North Carolina and South Carolina. And some of that social and ecological history uh, uh, which we draw from, you can read there's another fantastic book by Judith Carney called Black Rice. Mm -hmm. Very, very excellent it's book. Cited, it's cited. And we, we stole the, the maps of Africa from that book. Those yeah. are, we just Did lifted we those. Huh? We still I didn't make it, did you? Well, but they're <laughs> no. not down on the copyright, were they? No, I mean, we cited them. Yeah, well, know. we cited them. I don't know. If it, <laughs> oops. Thank you, Judith. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think, uh, uh, okay. Let, let, let's just, our audience is getting, getting kind of, they want to get involved. Oh, okay, yeah. Because I think they got some, we, we already know this audience here is special. Yeah, this is a special audience. <laughs> so, yeah, with that, May, and we'll talk about let's the. Go, let's go through some of the. Oh, other you want to look at this? Okay. Well, remember we talked about how the Everglades was like a whole big chunk of Florida. Yeah, yeah. Look at how the Spanish drew. This is it's it's an English language copy of a Spanish map. This is probably 1740, um, and you can see the way they draw the Florida Peninsula as being just inundated with these streams and stuff like that, almost yeah, like a yeah. like a archipelago here, because yeah. this is all Everglades, Everglades swampland coming up to. Um, I think this is where Tampa would be, right there. And um, here's St. Augustine. And then right above St. Augustine, you'll see Fort Musa. So Fort Musa is what is today called Fort Mose. But its original name, Fort Musa, Musa Arabic, the Arabic pronunciation of Moses, right? Um, very, very, very significant um, name clearly given to the community by the formerly enslaved, self-emancipated African people who have fled there and established this town themselves. And it's an important thing to note because as Modibo explains in the book, this community is often misunderstood as a place that was built by the Spanish for black people to come to, right? But that's not what it was. This was, this, this was a settlement that was established uh, by these freedom seekers uh, and named and some version of that name, even though the Spanish misspelled it and mispronounced it, some version of that name was recorded. So that name, Fort Mose, which is what they call it now, if you go down to the museum, that's what they'll call it, that derives directly from Fort Musa. Um, and so there it is on the map. There's the evidence right there, Fort Musa. Um, so that's why uh, we included this map in the presentation. Here you can see, if you, weren't, if you didn't know that Georgia prior to Oglethorpe had a history of uh, Spanish colonial presence. This is a list that shows all the rivers and all of the Spanish missions. And uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about the mission system, but this is the Spanish presence on the Georgia coast. Yeah, want, want to say one, one thing about policy so you understand. <clears throat> uh, policy, when a government or a state does something, they are not doing it because they enlightened or they figure they should have to do it. They're doing it in response to social movement. And that's why the St. Augustine, you could see that that, 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 that fort at St. Augustine, that Fort Mose, was the response to the people coming down there. It wasn't like the Spanish put up something and invited people to come. It, it, and it's just like that with the Civil Rights Movement. Civil Rights Movement and the laws that that took place, you know, the, the equal rights law, all the laws in the 1960s and stuff, that was a response to the social movement from below. So I always say that policy is epiphenomenal. 
this is a very vital concept. So, you, so when, you, when you're criticizing something, you'll know where to look. An epiphenomena is something that exists, but it doesn't exist in the form that it appears. For example, moonlight. Moonlight is light. It appears to come from the moon, but it's really reflected sunlight, you see. So the, the concept of an epiphenomenological manifestation of something, while it sounds big and bad and everything, it's very, very simple. When somebody lies to you, I mean, you, you don't know very much if you say, well, he's lying. But they don't lie because they like to lie. They lie because they're trying to hide some truth from you. So go find the truth, and then you'll understand why they lied. OK. Uh, are we ready, to, we ready to entertain any kind of questions that you might have, or any kind of comments you might want to make? And I think this group is small enough for, I don't know if you could be heard, but we'll see. And if you don't ask questions, we're just going to keep talking until you leave. No, I'm not going. I'm not going to talk anymore. I will. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, oh. We have a mic too. If you if you want to, uh, or you can just you can do whatever you want. Can we get a runner? Can we get a runner just to take the mic around? What, what does it? It's not wireless. But it's got a long long cord. Well, that's all right. But let's try it. Let's try it by just talking loud. Okay. So I want to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were interacting with each other. Sure, they were. Yeah. How would you say that played into the not so often talked about history of the indigenous tribes who did enslave uh, the Africans as well? To say, hey, these are folks that are not unskilled laborers, like uh, we might be led to believe, but these are folks that you know, yeah. these lands, so they would be uh, good slaves for us as well, which they, you know, a lot of larger tribes. I, I, uh, yeah, great question. I get into the intricacy of slavery among certain native populations in Virginia and North Carolina, and I show how that evolved. I mean, at, at first, see, it wasn't really slave for the native people. The native people followed a system of adoption at first, but it became slavery when they started introducing fur trade and commodity trade and capitalist exchange, and then people's labor and people themselves became commodities. Then the native people were part of that, some, some, some strata of the native people. And so if you read the book, you'll see a little, dis uh, well, it's quite a, uh, quite a uh, distinction made right there. Uh, and of course, there are people who like to exploit this difference. But the Cherokee, who, who, which were, um, if you go to Oklahoma, and this is, you know, 100 years later, 100 some years later, when cotton was being produced all over, yeah, some of the Cherokees, some of the black people owned slaves, you know, but, it, and, and if you, you, if you take the race analogy too far, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna get entangled in some stuff that doesn't make sense. So, yes, slavery was a social phenomena that was practiced to a greater or less degree among white slave owners, Native American slave owners, and even black slave owners, and particularly in Louisiana. But you have to be honest about it all. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that like that, the encounter, and the the proliferation of the of the slavery system, was something that like, in if you look at the history in, like Muscogean. Uh, communities and in Cherokee communities like this was a major point of contention like there were people who who participated in this for sure and there were a, also a whole lot of other people who were like how dare you sure. and um, so yeah it, it created it created major rifts which of course the the uh, the settler colonial you know white elites could exploit and um, yeah so I don't know if you want to say anything well, about that? Well, I, I wanted to say also too, there's a point made in the book that when the slave, when the native removal policy went into effect in 1830 something, they created a whole group of people called Seminoles, and they were really an integrated group of people. They were they, they were black, they were white, they were they would they would be from uh, an actual Seminole, look like your grandfather, or like your uncle, or somebody, but they had to be characterized 
as, um, as Indians so they could take their land and remove them under this policy. So if you look at it real carefully, you'll find that the removal policy called these people Seminoles who own land in what is now the Panhandle of Florida and removed these people, including what they call them slaves. Now what, 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 the, what the Seminoles did sometimes in order to keep people from having to go back to the slave trade when the slave was, slavery was going on in Georgia and stuff, they would say, you can't take him. He's my slave. It's my slave. You know, and of course the slave hunters would say, well, we ran into some people who owned slaves. But the point is that when a large number of native people, a large number of slaves left and, and created um, towns and villages in the panhandle, what is now the panhandle of Florida, near uh, uh, and integrated themselves with the native population, that when the slave hunters would come down there, they just say, look, these, 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 these people here are my slaves. You can't take my property. And they use that, native people use that sometimes to circumvent the policies of the time. I think that like maybe we also uh, could have been a little more clear about what was happening with um, at, as the, the colonialism is expanding, slavery system is expanding, people are constantly fleeing, um, at, which I, I think that this audience probably knows. Um, and at the same time, there's, there's also anti-colonial resistance happening among native people. So here, this is the, this, uh, this, this word here is pronounced Wally. And this is, uh, the, the Wally people lived in this area. This is the Georgia coast, by the way. And they had a series of rebellions beginning in, uh, against the Spanish mission system beginning in 1597. Um, and uh, the biggest one actually got its start right here in St. Catherine's Island. This was kind of the capital of the Spanish mission system. And um, so when people who were enslaved emancipate so themselves. St. Catherine's Island is right off the coast of Liberty County, where Riceboro, Georgia is. Yeah. Probably the, the closest, I closest island. Closest Berry Island there. Right, yeah. Um, I used to take my grandkids out there on, on a kayak. Now nobody's <laughs> allowed there, and it's full of uh, lemurs, actually. Yeah. Um, Oh, sorry. There were two kinds of rice. There was what they call wet rice and dry rice. Now, the wet rice variety is the one that grew well in, in, uh, south, in Georgia, on the, on the coast of Georgia and South Carolina. But rice came out of uh, uh, the evolve, uh, evolution of uh, cereal production in, in, in the hearts of Africa, and it, it went west to China. Uh, so it's hard to tell what kind of rice went where, but by the, by the time they started bringing rice over here, it was a commodity that could be grown by a, a technically advanced group of people for money. Now, you, you know that rice is, um, some people argue that rice came from Africa, some people argue that it came from China. You know, some of those arguments, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, what it was, it was a commodity that, was, that, that caused a lot of problems. It was a surplus that people were struggling over, and people organized themselves all kinds of different ways to produce it. But uh, rice definitely was a part of Africa for a long time. There's a really good book um, that I just started to dip into that actually talks about the specific species of, of rice and mm -hmm. their African names and... and um, I think it's called Deep Roots, but now I can't remember the name of the author. Uh, but yeah, if you're curious about like specifically where in Africa and what species of rice were being grown and uh, where in the, both in Africa and in, in North America, uh, that's the book I would check out. I think it's called Deep Roots. But, but I think this is a good approach. Like for instance, when I, when I was just trying to learn about uh, the different production, different, different forms of capitalist production, I, I started studying the production of various commodities like sugar and uh, tobacco and rice and indigo and of course in the Caribbean it's sugar and uh, what else what else did they grow down there primarily sugar and of course then with bauxite with the aluminum production and everything but uh, the, if you want to uh, now the petrochemicals are central stage 
So if you want to understand the history of the international capitalist system, you can approach it by looking at various commodities and their historical way of uh, way they influence society. It, it's, it's a good approach. This lady here was drinking. Who? I think so. It, it, it includes, matter. If you go there now, that, that, that's not, I'm, I'm not sure where that ends and begins. Uh, where, what's the city there? You know the city in that county. Yeah. How, how far? How far is it from uh, the Virginia border over there? How far is it from Elizabeth City? How far is it from Elizabeth City? But it's right in that area. And but if you if you if you talk to the people in that area, they're the same people. They they came out of the swamp. They're Indians. They're black. They're all kind of people. And some of them uh, identify themselves as even Tuscarora. And these are the ones that became what they call Lumbees in Lumberton, North Carolina, which is further to the west. But they went north into, into New York and became a part of the, uh, the uh, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, or sometimes called the Iroquois Confederacy. That's a wing of them. And they had a representative government there. So these people were, these people were advanced in terms of the way they decided to live their lives. Now, they fought, too. But, but what I've learned is that the fighting that they did was, because, was after like the, uh, the fur trade entered into the equation. The furs is a good way of, of, of commodity that you can study too. The fur trade entered it, and of course the, the, the French coming down from Canada exacerbated the difference. And uh, the Haudenosaunee wanted to monopolize the fur trade later to the West and all kind of configurations went on. And then when the American government became independent, they really started you know, putting the hurting on people to the West. So all of that is a part of the, the, the legacy that is all of us. And uh, if you look in the room, here we are. <laughs> I want to see this back there. Yeah. Now these were classical Spanish from Spain, and they were looking. They were colonials looking for gold. And now they had an empire now. I mean, a legit empire, and it stretched. And that's why the Mexicans speak. Uh, that's why they speak. They speak Spanish. They even had a. And of course, they had a, Mexico extended all the way up to what is now Northern California, and included Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas. As far as that is concerned, the point is that these people have a, uh, a, a Mexican, I mean, a, 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 a Spanish legacy. You know, they, their relationship, to be simplistic, their relationship to Spain was similar to the American slavers was to England. You know, but they were contesting one another. And of course, Puerto Rico is part of it too, you know. They, they came and went, and then there are all kind of treaties. I go through some of the treaties in the book where Cuba was ceded to the, America, uh, to the uh, English for a while, and then it was ceded back to the, uh, to the Spanish. So it was a, a zone of contention over here. It was, the, it was literally the, the new world, you know? And the, the zone of contention that emerges in Georgia and Florida, right? Like, I think that one thing that we should probably clarify is that like so many different people of different ethnic backgrounds, both indigenous peoples from North America, uh, people who had escaped slavery, um, who had originally come from Africa, um, and even uh, some like disaffected white people who fled various uh, European colonial towns because life there sucked. Um, they, they gathered in these peripheral places away from uh, the coastal um, I mean, this is an older map. This is this is Spanish, but oh wait, but let's see. I mean, the, in in all of this kind of contested area, so that's where you end up with these um, groups of people like the Yamasee, mm -hmm. like the Seminoles and stuff, because there's no colonial power structure here. It might be claimed by the either the British or the Spanish, but they don't really have any authority there, and so you end up with these 
multiracial, multi-ethnic um, communities of resistance proliferating in these zones here. And it becomes a very, very significant social mm -hmm. force that leads to uh, what they call the Seminole Wars. Yeah. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. No, well, I do want to say about the way in which these people were mixed, mixed ethnic people. They were not, they, see all this, all this, uh, we don't cotton to no racial mixing and stuff. That came as a result, as after the Civil War in America, in the South. And then the, the, the literature, the people write as if that's, that's the way it always has been down here. But that, people were mixing. I mean, come on now, look around. People were mixing. They were, I mean, they were mixing. <laughs> they were mixing, sure enough. And even, even during the Reconstruction period, they were mixing. And so these, these, these policies that they had, you gotta look at the policy now. There's no such thing as a Seminole tribe of Indians, except in the minds of the government. And, and of course they did that for expedient reasons, so you know. So a couple of those um, communities that Modibo is talking about are, show up on this map here. They just call them Indian towns. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but I mean, that, the reason why they're not more specific, because as you can see, Spanish maps can be very, very complete, right? The reason why they're not more specific, and this is another English language copy of a Spanish map. There, you can find versions of this in, I think this is also from 1740, maybe earlier. Um, you can find the same thing in Spanish. Um, uh, the reason why they're not more specific is because it's, it's a, it's a multi-ethnic community. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is St. Augustine, right? Probably a lot of folks have been here. This is the uh, 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 San Marcos Castle. And then here, this is Fort Mose, which a good half of Modibo's book is written about this community here. Excuse me, I do need to say something else about this. This site was preserved by local people hounding the Florida government to make sure that this was a part of the Florida um, park system. When I first went to this uh, site, I knew about the site back about 25, 30 years ago, only one little marker there from the Florida Historical Society said that this was a, uh, uh, where these uh, Spanish people uh, had a black fo a fort here and blah, 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 blah. And it helped defend St. Augustine, the best, you know, the Castile best, bastion of Fort Augustine, uh, 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 down there in St. Augustine. So you, you gotta understand, these people pressured and pressured and pressured, I'm talking about local people. Some people came from the north and moved into the area. They were just local buffs, you know, historical buffs, and they, and they raised money. And now if you go down there, it's a highly developed uh, museum with uh, accurate maps and accurate uh, depictions of who the people were. And, and you, you know, if you see some, like I went down there and told them, because they had the Spanish, um, the Spanish or soldiers represented as white soldiers at one time. And so I went over there and told them that these were not white soldiers, they were really mulattoes and black soldiers. And I went back and they had, you know, they had changed that. And uh, of course, I gave him some money too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm on the little wall up there. The lifetime member of the Fort Mose Historical. Yeah, well, yeah, whatever it is. Down yeah. there. But uh, the point is that all these local groups are now beginning to become interested in their own history. And that's, that's, that's the result of it. This here is an artist rendering of uh, Fort Mose. Um, and uh, in, in all the descriptions of, of the place, they always talk about, even the contemporary descriptions, they talk about the houses being, and the buildings being constructed in an African style, mm -hmm. uh, which, with the thatched roofs. Um, and here you can see uh, uh, some of the, the symbols that the, the museum associates with the place. I don't know what the origin of those symbols are, do you? But, but they, anyway, the artist put them on the houses here. Yeah, I, don't know. I think some, some, some of these original um, Africans actually were Muslim. That's true. Very. You know, yeah. They were not Christian. Of course, the Catholic Church had you know Christian priests, and that's why you see that that church over there with the cross on. Yeah. And and even you can go into St. Augustine now. You can go in St. Augustine now, and you can see the minarets and stuff like they were talking. You want you want to say something, Tiba? 
We didn't see. Sorry, these lights are the lights are blinding. Light, yeah, lights are That's why we said everybody got to move closer. We That's a very good question. Right. Well, uh, we agree there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of them do. And, uh, but peop that doesn't mean that the people haven't been struggling to keep that from happening. No, in the end, we, we're going to have directly democratic societies in a decentralized way. Otherwise, we ain't going to have no planet to live on. They, they, that don't mean that they have a, a directly democratic society. It don't mean that everybody votes. In, 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 in a, it means that they discuss and reach a consensus. And consensus is usually about that way. But you know, back to your original point about how do uh, societies which start off flat emerge into hierarchical society. Now, the, the fact of the matter is hierarchical societies have existed in human societies for a limited period of time. Even when you had these big nation states like, um, well, they, they call them empires. They were just small states, but like um, what was happening in the Tigris and the Euphrates and what was happening in Egypt. The ma vast majority of the human beings were living in flat societies, directly democratic societies. And then every once in a while, people, people would come around. My history, reading that history, every time these um, big centralized societies would emerge, there would be a, a, a sweep across and where the barbarians come and take over. The barbarians are the people who are, are trying to, <laughs> if you, you, you know, every time in Rome and the barbarians came and destroyed all of Rome and then we had to rebuild it again. And then, and then you got Genghis Khan sweeping out into the step, steps of Europe and destroying these hordes and stuff. These were the democratic forces trying to stop these people from brutalizing everybody. And so what we have to do is rewrite the history so we can see that these, and not only that, the, the technological stuff, the, um, the, 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 these uh, advances in human food production and all that, they were, that was designed first by people who were farmers. It was weaponized and changed when people who had monopoly of arms came in there and usurped it. So we, we just have to rewrite the history and show how if we're gonna have a planet, we're gonna have to live together. And we're gonna have to stop this uh, state, what I call state creep. State creep. They come in. They come in at you. I mean, like you, you, you'll make a, you'll make an advancement. Next thing you know, they come in, and uh, they'll send somebody in, and you're back where we started. Yeah, I'm glad this is an active audience. Our friend here. Be next. Can, it, can you hear that? Can you hear, can, it, can you hear her? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Oh, well, I've heard stories of folks talking about like how those children were No, 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 but people, <laughs> well, people, <laughs> but, but pe people, people were desperate and they were trying to do what they can to, to ensure their survival. And that's one reason they ran away. I mean, they, they did all kind of other things too. But, but the, the, the braid rice, and rice was a decorative adornment, dried rice, especially the uh, dried rice kind. Uh, and you could wear it around your neck as a, and, you know, you can string it like a bead if you like. And if you get hungry, you can eat it if you want, you know. 
But the point is that, that I, I agree that that's, pro that's probably what would happen as a cultural uh, affirmation. Uh, and we, we eat right now, that's a cultural retention. Uh, well, okay, well, right. it's enough for everybody. It's enough for everybody now, but see, in slave time, you, you, <laughs> there wasn't enough for everybody. There's a, there's a question right over here. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Ah, oh, you know about the Miko. You read the book. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> Miko. No, well, 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 the Miko had a specific role, but he was chosen by the women of the society who knew the guy. And they know he wasn't going to be going around beating up people and everything. And he had no more arms than anybody else. Everybody had a, everybody had an equal amount of weapons. But the Miko, how do you understand the role of the Miko? This is this is in Muskogee society. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but well he, he, was, he was more of a skilled hunter and a person who the people could benefit from. He, no, he wasn't a leader. He was a proto-executive. He, he got people. No, 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 he wasn't a leader in our sense. Now, we got to, work, we got to keep the words out of our mouths that, 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 that define what this, this society says. But I'm glad you brought that up. Amico is a, he, he, was, he knew about the, um, the land, he knew about the land, he was a hunter, he provided food for people. When people brought the food back, uh, he would share the food. He, he didn't eat all the food that he been. <laughs> he shared the food. And uh, the Yehola, Yehola was a, a, was a warrior who protected, he was a younger man, and oftentimes the Yehola became a Miko. But uh, Yehola couldn't become a Miko unless the women said he, he was qualified to become a Miko. And the reason that the women knew that is because they were the midwives and they would give birth and they would uh, uh, they knew all of the members of the group from birth to when they got to be adults now the Henneho, what do you what do you understand about him yeah yeah, yeah he, he he was the one who had the uh, the uh, the memory of the grouping, and now, now he was the dangerous fellow, because sometimes he embellished the truth and sometimes he uh, told lies, and then people people the women checked him. So I'm saying I'm saying that there was no nobility, there was no inherited office. Could nobody the Miko son wasn't going to become no Miko. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was chosen by a council. Uh, the, dif the difference is that, that this person doesn't wield any coercive authority. Dang. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't. He does. I still think of him as a leader with that, because I just, I think of that as a line of where they're not going to be able to do it. Okay, okay, okay. Well, if you. Yeah, I, th I think it's a, it, leader is a complicated word because yeah, there's. Because there's, there's, there's the implications, all kind of implications. Yeah, yeah. Um, especially like, I mean, I think, and I, to your point, Modibo. Uh, we got to understand that that hierarchical governance, especially the idea of the state, mm -hmm. right, and the na and the na well the sp nation state specifically, these are exported by colonialism, right? These these assumptions about how society uh, is supposed to be organized or like inevitably becomes organized is like, it wasn't inevitable. It was forced upon people. It was forced upon people militarily through occupation. And across, around the world, I mean, there's the old saying, the sun doesn't set on the British Empire, right? Because they colonized half the damn, the, somewhere across the entire mm -hmm. planet. Mm -hmm. And, um, and through, through English, Spanish, Dutch, Portuguese colonialism, these models of governance are exported. And uh, in, you know, way later in national liberation movements, 
uh, people are kind of forced by circumstances to model themselves, you know, off of this. So the, the end result is that you end up with very similar politically structured representative nation states proliferating across the entire planet. Do I have that right? Or yeah, some black, some Chinese, some all kind of thing to form. But I'm glad you mentioned the institutional, the institutional implication of this. That's very, that's very, very critical. Very, very critical. But the, uh, the, the, the medicine, what they call, see, th another thing, when, when they write the history, they'll make the Miko a king. They, they'll make the Miko a... Um, and they did. They did, yeah. They'll make the Miko a, a big, big chief, or take me to your leader. And if the Miko, uh, if, he, if they said uh, something, something to the Miko, and he said yes, then that became the law, and that's why everybody, you know, they had no understanding of collective... See, these, these colonial people, just to extend, extend in our Andrew's point, th these colonial people who came here were from highly regimented and rigid societies. We're going to get to you right next, man. Yeah, uh, yeah he was standing there waiting. <laughs> these, these, these people knew no other way of looking at it. So when they came here, they imposed that on everybody. Look, let me, let me understand this so you all understand this. This ain't nothing foreign. Come, come on now. Uh, I've, I've been talking to people. Uh, even my own kids, you can't tell me that. I don't believe that, blah, blah. And, and, and women now are standing up. You can't tell me that. I'm not going to have it. <laughs> you know, the point is people don't like to be told what the hell to do. <laughs> oh, really? The people you, you're talking, talking about, people will always rebel against that. And I like this woman rebellion now. They ain't taking this shit. You know what I mean? That's direct democracy in the house. You know, it, it, you know, women go say, I'm going to work and coming back and you sitting around here doing nothing. No, no, you, you better get your job or something. That's direct democracy in the house. And if you do something and don't ask, you know, if you, if you go buy a house, another house without consulting your wife or anybody concerned, then you're gonna have a problem. So people understand direct democracy. It's, it's, uh, I understand it very well, because I don't like people telling me what to do. You know? Now, if they're saying something that I agree with, then we cool. We can go out and do it together, you know what I mean? And, and we, can have, we can have us an a intimate, direct experience, you know? <laughs> My man. You, yeah, you've, you've been waiting very patiently. Uh, Oh yeah, it ain't much left, is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Making those shingles and what they're doing. Shingles, yeah. Well, 
Yeah, let me, let me, let me say something about the workers' history, workers' struggle. <clears throat> workers' struggle is um, part of uh, the concept of looking at struggle within the reformist nation state. They wanted workers' rights, higher salary, higher, better living standards within the context of a, of a set up nation state. Now, the first thing that we, there was attempts to make worker struggle international with the old communist movement and then of course the Trotskyist movement. But the point is that workers now are not just people who go to work in industrial factories and people who, so who is a worker? And uh, in this book here, uh, if you read the last essay uh, about what was happening in Vieques, the, the contradiction now is not between the capitalist and the worker. The basic contradiction is between people and, and the e ecological motion, you see. And women have taken a, a, a forthright position in that struggle in Vieques. Of course it was a reform struggle. But everybody was in that struggle because everybody breathes the same air and eats the food and, and uh, the effects of ecological degradation was taking place among everybody. So we're gonna have to look at whether or not we wanna live on a clean continent or a clean world or a clean planet and we're gonna have to do away with this American exceptionalism. That's some dangerous stuff. That's some very dangerous stuff. People want to be free and all this kind of stuff, but they want Americans to be free. But there's a whole world out there, you know? In America, the American government is responsible for most of this degradation in the world. So yeah, they're going to, this, this worker struggle in terms of trade union struggle, that's a thing of the past. Uh, we have to reform that, re-look re at, re in your words, rethink that. And I know we all thinking about it then, so just keep on rethinking. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the railroad workers and see if oh, they, yeah. like, mm -hmm. actually, I mean, you know, I know it's a long shot, but I'm hoping for some kind of wildcat strike with that because I think, Modibo, to your point about, like, uh, the, the, the perils of, of representative government and stuff, we have currently with that railroad worker situation. So like you have all of these people who can't, don't even have sick days, can't even get sick days for their job, yeah. want to go on strike for sick days. And they've got like these so-called representatives of the people who are elected, right? Many of them with a lot of mon time and money spent by trade unions to get these people elected, right? And that just sold them, sold them right the fuck out. Yeah. And that's the Democratic Party, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and like, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's really, it's quite disturbing. And like, I think like to your question, you know, there's, there's always these moments that like, the direct action is always like, gonna be where it's at for when you're looking for what's gonna change the course of history. But like, I, you know, we're, we're very much still in it. And, uh, and I think that the railroad workers example, which by the way, if everybody's not familiar with what's going on with that, look that shit up because it's crazy. The um, that that's a prime example of how like it's not just the capitalists and the, the the individual like robber baron capitalists that we're up against anymore. It's it's, it's like literally the entire hi hierarchical structure of society that just like you know left right whatever came out against these workers over the last couple of weeks. Including their own leadership. Yeah, including, including, including their own union leadership. Including their own bureaucratic leadership. And I, the, I would like to see them strike too. Yeah. I, I like to see them disrupt it. You know what I mean? You, you gotta, and if you're gonna do anything, I'm sorry to interrupt you, there, but, but, but you, you gotta stop the action from going taking place. You yeah. know what I mean? You can't let it, you can't be on your own best behavior when you do these things. You know, it's just like you have to just go in there with a group of people and stop the stuff from happening. Then they'll see how important it is. And you'll see how, how they start running around then. And the, the other thing is like, you know, they'll say, oh, well, it's gonna disrupt the economy. That's the point of a strike. <laughs> the point of, that's the whole point. You strike to disrupt the economy. That's what, that's why you're doing it. And then you got to Yeah, <laughs> this is the whole. <laughs> then, you got, then you got the labor bureaucratic, bureaucrat saying, well, we don't wanna do that, do we? <laughs> who's this we? Yeah, who's we?
Well, slavery was very complicated, and it depended upon what you needed and, 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 and a, as a labor force. It was a labor force, no, no doubt. But it was complicated in the sense that when the slave uh, patrollers, which, which is the antecedent of the modern police, they were trying to round up slaves and, and, and sell them for, for money back into slavery. If you, were <coughs> if you were married to a slave, a woman who had run away, and you had been down there for a while, and these people come looking for your wife, you're going to say, well, this, this is my property. What are you doing? Oh, this is my property. As a strategic thing. Yeah, it's just a strategic thing that they usually use. Now, child slavery and indentured labor is different. Child slavery is, uh, as it was practicing at first in Virginia, is, is when, you were, when your mother was a slave, then you were a slave for life if you were born here. Now, and it's interesting to note that in 1619, when they say the first slaves set foot, they weren't really slaves. They were chattel, chattel labor, because Virginia didn't even have slave laws yet. And then they passed the slave laws and made those people uh, uh, slaves for life. And that's what we mean by classical slavery. And of course, there were African people here before 1619. Yeah, they were well before, as we talked. As a matter of fact, uh, <coughs> in Virginia, there around uh, around uh, Jamestown, there were black farmers, uh, you know, who had uh, tobacco farms who employed black labor during the before 1619. So you know, the, the little the, the little dogma breaks down after a while. Yeah, and and it's also like it's very. Well, it's, it's actually impossible to talk about, like, slavery among indigenous societies in any kind of broad brush strokes. It, it just didn't, it didn't work like that. If, yeah. I mean, cause that, that's, those kinds of big sweeping policies uh, are the product of, of these larger empires, like, like the English and the Spanish, which also, by the way, have vi had very different systems of, of slavery, actually, between the two of them. Other questions? Our friend here. Yeah, I was going to say, even to complicate it further, yes. you can see, like, with Leopold, with King Leopold, when he came into the Congo, he did that under the guise of abolishing slavery from the Iroquois. Very good and point. You know what happened yeah. when he was responsible for it. So even, I mean, it's just such a complicated, multi-layer thing that happened over such a, such a long period of time that the same way these people were anti-slavery, well, to what degree? Right. You know what I mean? Because they're pressured from the church, and they're saying, you know, I think we need well, to publish this book. Yeah, we're going to finish it off. In the Congo. we finish it off. But, but we, 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 we want, the basic point of the book is that the American government, in pre-colonial and colonial times, especially after they became independent, was a slave state all over. It wasn't just the South. It wasn't just the North. It was all over. And they were spreading slavery west. They were, they were the quintessential undemocratic social formation that was really um, marauding. All, even they were up in Ontario there trying to fight the native people up there. You know, they were just, uh, it, was just it was just a vicious thing that they needed to claim. You know what I mean? Because they had military and militia and all that stuff up there, killing Indians and killing uh, and enslaving African people and, and the way they you know, it's just it's just amazing, and 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 and, and when, I just want to appeal to you, just like what you did. That was very noble. You stopped by the Dismal Swamp, see what the hell was going on there. Well, if you're down in St. Augustine, do that. Read some of these historical markers. Go out to uh, there's a plantation out there. What's that plantation out there? Oh, in Kingsley. The King Kingsley, Kingsley plantation. Whoa. No, I know the Kingsley one. That's oh. that, that's right there out of Jacksonville. Which one are you talking about? I'm talking about the one in Louisiana. The oh, the uh, Whitney. Whitney Plantation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, take a look at some of these places because they have a lot of lessons to teach if you would only like. Yeah. Just one more question. Oh, yeah, yeah. please. Okay. In the course of listening, it's interesting. I didn't, I mean, we all have different ideas, but I didn't get the sense that there was any You've been you've you've been to the Kingsley Plantation. Um, I, I, I well, next time you go down there, go down, go go by if you want. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs>
One, one more point, if you don't mind. One more point. Well, let me get in after you. Okay, sure. <laughs> one more point. Um, my next book, by the way, this is going to be a trilogy. This is the first two parts of the trilogy. The next book is, is going to be named, what is it going to be named, Andrew? The working Crit title, I think, is uh, State, State Creep, Creep and, and Critical, critical Historiography. Critical Historiography. We're going to document instances of how hierarchy emerged in one, two, three, four, four so-called empires stretching across the Euro-Asian continent. And uh, you'll, see, you'll see some stuff there. But, but, but the point I'm going to make, this is the real, real point, is that sometimes we can't see stuff right in front of our eyes. Even, even the wisest and the most skilled scientists, say 100, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, didn't know that atoms existed, but they thought that they did because they saw evidence of the existence of atoms. Now, what, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to look in this ancient Chinese histories and find direct democratic social formations that I can point to or traces of them. So the point is sometimes you can see a trace and you can infer the existence of something that you can't see with your naked eye. Which is a very, it's a, and that's something I think like in the time that we've known each other that's been probably the, uh, probably the, 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 my, the best lesson that I've learned just from yeah, working with so, you is yeah. that you have to train yourself how to see when you're looking at history, right? When you're reading a, a book, anything related to history, never ever just read it and be like, oh, like, as, as if it's like you're just absorbing knowledge, right? You need, to know, you, you need to know the agenda of the author, right? And you need to know what it is they believe. You need to know everything about their uh, worldview that you can so that you can interrogate what it is they're trying to actually accomplish with that piece. Because history is, in general, propaganda. Not saying propaganda in a sense that it's scary, but somebody's trying to get you to believe something about the world. And we're trying to get you to believe something very specific about the world, that this thread of direct democracy, direct democracy this thread of, of, of intimate social relations has been a, a, a force, uh, a, a constant social force throughout history. Ignored. That's been ignored. Right, right. Um, it, it, if I could just uh, tell you about a couple of images, just in case anybody has any questions about them. This, um, so here's artist renderings of Fort Mose, right? Now, this is actually going to uh, talk about an archaeological avenue of what Modibo was talking about is um, this entire area, the coastal region of Georgia and Florida, w w which some of us are very familiar with, um, is subject to extreme changes in the ecology, right? The islands, all the barrier islands move. I don't know, like some folks don't realize that, but the, the sand, the land gets washed away from one end of the island and deposited on the other, so they, they, they move. They're constantly in a state of change. In addition to that, there's been like a lot of dredging and other like ecologically destructive things. So where once you had this, and now this is an island that's off, when you go to visit the Fort Mose Museum, it's not on the site of Fort Mose because the site of Fort Mose is underwater. And there's a little tiny island that kind of sticks up and this is me, Margo and I, we took our kayak out there to take some pictures of it. This is, you can see, this is where they're still doing some archeological research and stuff there. But it took them a long time to find this site. They knew generally the, the area where the fort probably was, but they had to do a lot of underwater archeology span to actually pinpoint the exact site, which is still ongoing. Um, and so what, Modiba, what you were talking about of like try, having to infer something by its absence is also an archeological practice, right? Um, and but so... Then when you find it, it's just really, it's really rewarding. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, ah, the, so this is, this is the, this land, the original Fort, uh, 
actually, well, the Fort Mosaic, if you read the book, it actually, there were two of them. It got, gets destroyed and rebuilt. The second one, the evidence of it is in, under this very, very shallow island, which at high tide is almost completely underwater. Um, and then the other one is over here somewhere. Um, this is another map that's a plot of some of the, the farmland that was being cultivated between St. Augustine, which was here, and Fort Mose, which is here. Um, and and uh, all of this land, um, according to the sources at the time, was cultivated by uh, black farmers. Um, this is a representation of the Battle of uh, what they call Bloody Musa, or Bloody Mose, um, uh, wh where the uh, Fort Mose militia uh, defended uh, basically St. Augustine uh, against uh, the, the Oglethorpe and the British. This is in the Bastille part. That's the Bastille where the wall is. Yeah. And you see the Native American guy over there. Oh, yeah. Um, this is an artist rendering, very famous painting of the Great Dismal Swamp and people fleeing into the swamp. Um, and, that's, of course, this is Odibo's book. Um, so I just wanted to share. All right, all right. But thank you so much. Oh, wait, we've got one more. Y'all know Maynard, don't you? Y'all know, I mean, there's, there are councils and mass meetings that you can have where everybody can talk. And people need to be respected in those conversations. Like, for instance, if you look at the Montgomery bus boycott, that's a big, big town, Montgomery, for that period of time. But they had mass meetings, and they decided what they're going to do. And uh, somebody says this, somebody says that, somebody makes, makes a fool out of himself. Somebody uh, says something very wise, somebody else picks up that, and uh, that's where you reach a consensus. And it's a practice thing now. You, you, and, and of course, you gotta organize yourself in smaller units uh, than, the, than the big whole metropolitan area altogether. Let me, let me just say one other thing about how it can work. There can be very various things about the big nation state center. They can do some things. Uh, say, for instance, you, you, the, the people in all these groups wanted to, decided that there should be uh, a, a minimum wage for every, everybody. And so the, the government in the center distributes the money, and that's it. And then when the money comes to the local people, then now you don't have any big corporations or big uh, industries polluting everything around. The people have to sit down and decide how they're going to do, do with that money, even though some people have individual money. But the point is, it's going to be a, a, a period of devolvement, devolvement that is taking more and more powers into the local community's hands. And you can see it happening somewhat now. Uh, and uh, a big municipality like Atlanta, it, uh, you know, it's going to have to be broken up into some neighborhood associations and some neighborhood groups and everybody's going to have to work together. Yeah, I think there's like... And federated, federated. Yeah, federated. I mean, and there's there's plenty of examples of those kinds of movements throughout history. I mean, like mm -hmm. you can, even if you want to look at like Barcelona and the Spanish Civil War or something like that, you know, it's definitely wor worth looking into. Um, yeah, and I like Modibo's point, I think, a part of that struggle to uh, decentralize uh, the, the way we understand the city, yeah. which by the way, like, we, you mentioned Murray Bookchin earlier. Yeah. Murray Bookchin wrote like three or four books on that exact topic, which totally worth reading. Um, one's called The Limits of the City. The other one's called uh, Urbanization Without Cities. And there's a few more. Um, that, that's, that's an important point. See, we, we live in urbanized spaces. Yeah. That's different than cities. Urbanized, that's that sprawl and shit going on every which way and nothing is associated with nothing else. And you walk down the street and you see a little storefront here. Store. That's not cities. That's urbanized uh, sprawl. And that, we're not talking about nothing like that. That's part of capitalist society. 
And what you do too is, I mean, like, I mean, and you know this from your own experience, is like, is, is creating places where, you know, public places where people can, like, you're familiar with, with, the, with the forest, right? Like, spaces in which, you know, people can, can gather and start to develop these kinds of uh, uh, directly democratic relationships with one another. And Consciously and intentionally. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, like, that's part mod modibo of, uh, of I, I mean, it's a constant thread throughout your work, but, but the question of, of the scale is, is always interesting. But once you kind of say, like, okay, let's table scale for now and look at how are we going to just approach it just me and my community where I, like, what's, what's my immediate community? How, do we, how are we working together? And, and proceed from, which is exactly what they did in the forest, uh, as far as I understand. And, um, you know, at least from the outset, right? Um, you know, Margaret and I, we were in some of those early meetings. And um, the, I think that, like, that's, that's where you start that, that process of dissolution. And I, I was a part of a community like that. I grew up in a place called Crossroads, which was a small community it's situated around three or four Baptist churches and a couple of uh, graveyards and one school. And uh, the, w the white people lived in the town. They were the merchants and stuff. But we lived in our community. Some of us were merchants too. But this was the remnants of uh, Sherman's Field Order Number 15. And we knew when we were coming up, we knew all the people and everybody knew us. Everybody knew who everybody was. We didn't even have no locks on the doors. Anybody ever grew up in a community like that? Oh, that, oh I guess it's foreign to you. <laughs> but this was during the segregated South. But what happened was black people carved out these little niches, these communities where the white people left us alone to our own devices, and we created something. It wasn't perfect, you know, when white people, it was incursion and stuff, but in terms of the day-to-day -day decisions of what was going on, Everybody knew, if somebody stole something, people knew who had it, because they knew who the thieves were. You know, you just go get it from the guy who stole it, you know? And, and, and uh, they, they know, they know who, when somebody was lying, they know people who were prone to exaggerate, so they just never believed nothing they said. And when they were in meetings and stuff, and this guy got up and started lying and stuff, people said, oh, not him, he's going, he's going off again. But then that was some, never you, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then some people, and then some people say he's going off, but he he might have a point there, you know, you know. So you know that's that's just an organic. <laughs> but never it's been such a, a good example. You know, y'all never been in a place like that. God. No, but, but you but you know why it's, it it speaks exactly to the question because like if Sun, imagine Sunbury and Darien pre Civil War, right? Yeah, yeah. These were like burgeoning, like emerging little, like very busy cities, right? These, on coastal Georgia, Sunbury, Darien, these are small towns, right? Yeah. Then you had this, uh, was effectively a revolution, uh, you know, around Recon the Civil War and Reconstruction, where these communities that you're talking about, right, where you yeah, grew yeah. up, um, um, established themselves. And, and that broke the thing up, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. It, and what's Sunbury now? It's dead. It's dead. It's a ghost yeah, town, yeah. right? But, but at one point, it was a major port city. And so, like, it, it, these things change, right? And, 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 and the topic of the, 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 idea, the notion of scale, it, it evolves with the struggle, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. But the point is, you, you're going to have to try it. You're going to have to figure it out. And people are capable of figuring out stuff, especially when, when a whole community is threatened. And I've seen that happen. When a whole community is threatened, like with um, fire or with a flood or something, People go into action. People, the, the little wimpy guys become big heroes. Mm -hmm. You know, when they getting people out of their houses and saving their dogs and all that kind of stuff. But the point I'm getting at is, you have to be able to find it. And if you can't find it, and if you're convinced otherwise, think of, think of people who wasn't look, look, looking for atoms. It never would be found. You, you, knew, you know that it's there. It's just like a tracker, you know what I mean? If you ever hunted in the woods, you know that the deer has been there because you see his feces, you see it's been rubbing up against a tree. It's signs everywhere. You can take a, 
take a piece of grass and smell the grass and know he ain't too far away. It's a great analogy. Yeah, but that's how you have to do it. And uh, sometimes people in the city don't understand that. But they know, I mean, you know, uh, you know when somebody's been, been in, you know, somebody comes to town, you go go to their favorite bar and ask, have they been in? If they ain't been in, then you know they ain't been there. You know, that's the way. <laughs> Y'all going to keep us here all day. What time we got to oh, get out of I don't know, but I'm sure we have time for a couple well, more. Well, a couple more. This is yeah. the last two. Yeah. The last three. We got five. Uh, we got three. Oh. Okay, so we'll do two. We'll do two. Right. Mm. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. But don't you choose your friends, don't you? And you stay on, you stay, you got their numbers and you talk all the time and you... Uh, well, I got some friends. I choose them. I, but I, I like this kind of situation because all the fools I can let go. And <laughs> <laughs> get out of my life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my friend, my uh, what, what did you say now? This consensus, building a consensus? Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have to vote on and you don't have to discuss everything. If 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 there's a flood coming down the street, you get a bucket or get something. And try. But 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 the consensus building is a very conscious process. Let me let me kind of I always good in the discussion with people about compromise and what compromise means. To me, compromise don't mean that two people, this is, the, this is the popular definition of compromise, two people are discussing something that, <clears throat> that they want and neither one of them will want to give up anything. And so they give up something and then they end up with something that neither of them want. So why, why would you want to compromise? The point is you have a discussion, you go into a discussion, a compromise session, open-minded, not you have some perspective, but you don't want nothing in particular, and you understand and respect everybody in there who has the discussion. So you you're talking, you're talking, and then sometimes people bring up stuff that you never even thought about, and the group uh, is enriched by the input of all of the people because you have different experiences, and you come out with something much rigid, much 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 more richer than what a compromise could have been. You see, and uh, you got to be able to see that when it happens and to push it forward. Like sometimes when you're in the comment, yeah, I like that. You said so and so and so and so. You know, I was thinking about that myself, blah, 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 blah. And then somebody else. But the point is, when you go into a group session, just like this one, if you know more than we all in this group know, then you're in the wrong place. This co the collective wisdom and the collective knowledge and experience of this group is greater than any one of us, especially if you are part of the group yourself. I mean, that's kind of self-explanatory. Okay, that's, that's it. Y'all got some more burning questions? Oh, there's a burning question. You got a burning question. But that's a good question about compromise and consensus, yeah. The question is about reparation for black people, right? Okay. I don't know. I really don't. I don't even know what form it would take. But uh, I'm thinking that 
black people should have, you know, free education, you know, any place they want to go. But I don't know what form it would take. I, I'm, I haven't been uh, inter interrogating that question as much. Yeah. You have something to say about the press for reparation? For no, no, I'm, I'm interested in the, uh, for what people, how, how people perceive it and, and work it out for themselves. You yeah, know, I think yeah. that whatever consensus people come to on that question should be demanded and followed and, 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 and militantly uh, grabbed for, you know. Yeah, okay. You had a question? Anybody? We don't want to leave nobody out because that, that'll be un not democratic. If, if there's no more questions, maybe we could have a round of applause for my esteemed colleague. Well, it was a small group, but we were, we were like, like they say, we were small, but oh my. <laughs>